Welcome to Visionary, How William Blake Changed the World. I'm Jason Whitaker, a writer and academic at the University of Lincoln, and I've been working on William Blake for 30 years. I'm joined this week by Sharon Cho, a research associate at the Centre for 18th Century Studies at the University of York, where she completed her thesis on Blake, Old Norse Reception and Disability. We're also joined by Anise Rogers, an ECR whose work looks at William Blake's The Four Zoas and Poetical Forms. So recently we've been to see the exhibition William Blake's Universe at the Fitzwilliam Cambridge. This is a major retrospective that's taking place with a huge collection of Blake's art at the Fitzwilliam. So Sharon, if I can start with you to ask a little bit about your reactions to the exhibition in general. Yeah, so when I first heard about the exhibition, I was super excited, especially by the title, um, William Blake's Universe, because I think possibly because I was like approaching it and thinking about it from my own research, which does look at the Gothic, the antiquity stuff and the Northern antiquarianism connections to Blake. I was expecting uh, an exhibition that looks more about the universe building and myth making within Blake. Um, but actually it was about Blake's European connections, which was also a lovely surprise. <laughs> it wasn't what I was expecting. Um, but also it's just, it was also really exciting then to think that, or like to approach this as, oh, this is thinking about all the different connections, placing Blake within his contemporaries and beyond as well, because that is a really important aspect of his work. I came at it from a, just from the title, from a slightly different perspective. I was I was thinking it was going to be about the universe in which Blake lived, the world, uh, the, the connections between him and other artists, with maybe some myth-making connections, because that's what's usually meant by his universe um but yes it was it was mainly about the european links very interesting and very connected in ways i hadn't thought of before but it was it was a very good exhibition thanks both uh, i mean one of the things that really struck me it was a real opportunity i think for the first time for as long as i can remember actually to see the entire holdings of the fitzwilliam and that in many respects, that's still the most exciting thing for me after the event. It might be worth just talking a, a little bit in terms of the holdings at the Fitzwilliam, because for particularly for people who haven't had an opportunity to visit the exhibition yet or seen the catalogue, um, the Fitzwilliam, I mean, it has a number of exceptional pieces by Blake, particularly, I mean, famously, copies of America, Europe of Prophecy. It also has, you know, one of the best um, examples of Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience, which interestingly wasn't much on display in the show itself. I was really impressed that they had put up Paradise Regained because quite often you get the Paradise Lost um, illustrations for Milton and you don't get the Paradise Regained. So they hadn't got any of the Paradise Lost, which are quite famous and you can see them quite a lot at other places but they did have the paradise regained up on a whole wall presented so that you could follow the story if, if you like that was that was really really impressive I really enjoyed that the the uh, picture that stood out to me the most was probably a uh, death on a pale horse which I hadn't seen in person before and it it's spectacular it really is one of those pieces that just makes you step back and think, wow, this this artist is something else. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was very interested in the different plates that they had of like Europe and America because they didn't show all of the plates. They kind of had picked out um, yeah. individual ones and were kind of explaining them and they were part of a broader narrative in that one particular room kind of in the middle. Um, that I think was titled, like in the catalog, it's titled The Present to Europe in Flames, right? It was thinking about America and Europe. And so I was just very interested in, can't remember the exact plates that they had, but yeah, just like the choices that they made. And they had um, the little black boy, the, um, it was interesting to see how they'd actually picked out the plates to craft that little narrative around the room and to kind of think about the connections there. I mean, actually, that, that comment that you just made there in terms of the selection of plates from Europe and America, um, 
I mean, one general point about the exhibition as a whole, uh, and and this has actually become quite a familiar setting for, for lots of exhibitions, lots of art exhibitions at the moment. So that movement away from the white cube experience, you know, sort of the 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 blank walls which the 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 piece of work is just meant to stand out in almost in kind of floating spiritual isolation to these very brightly colored you know sort of blue green red and yellow uh, pathway that you follow through from kind of antiquity in the past through to european flames in the present red and violent um through then to this yellow gold which is obviously meant to be that that little spiritual journey that you go on through through the exhibition um, and within these, I mean, the, the the European flames, it was really noticeable about that kind of accordion effect where they've put all the, the selected plates, as you mentioned, to really, I, I think it's a way to try and defamiliarize these. Because, I mean, particularly the, the, the America plates, I've seen many, many times, both obviously reproductions, but also um, in the flesh, as it were, at different exhibitions. But to actually have that opportunity to to have them presented in that kind of, accordion off into the distance taking you through that journey was, was quite exceptional um and again one i spent an awful lot of time looking at was death on a pale horse strictly speaking i still think my, my favorite version from that period is actually um turner's death on a pale horse where he you know, he literally deconstructs the process of painting however one thing that really struck me looking at that image was actually just how astonishing Blake is almost as a graphic artist, as a designer. So, so it, was, it was it was very for me. It was a great opportunity to see many of the Fitzwilliam images. So in some cases, for the very first time that I've seen them outside of reproduction. I think for probably a number of people who would go to this exhibition expecting to see Blake in the round. They might be a bit disappointed that some of the most famous images, um, you know, Newton, Nebuchadnezzar, etc., the lot of large colour prints. Of course, the Fitzwilliam doesn't own copies of many of those. The the exhibition split into three parts. European Flames, the second part we've already talked about, and it ends with this notion of spiritual renewal, where a lot of the connections then with European art are made quite explicit. Um, but that first part, Antiquity in the Gothic, again, if you don't mind, Sharon, if I can start with you, because this is in many respects a speciality of yours. As, as you say, you kind of, you know, <laughs> the, the anticipation of what we're going to see obviously weighed heavily with you. So over to you, Antiquity in the Gothic and how Blake was presented in this exhibition. Yeah, so I honestly didn't really know what to expect because in itself antiquity and the gothic is such a broad <laughs> ranged topic you can come at it from so many different angles and for me personally I come at it from an old Norse angle which will be probably very different from other people and you know in terms of Blake's art as well it'll be a completely different angle again and I was really interested and you know I it was very informative as to how they were framing the Gothic and antiquity within this kind of art exhibition, because they were talking about the foundation of like the art academies across Europe, which I didn't know about because this is not my area specifically. And it was thinking about the Royal Academy in London, the Royal Danish Academy, and it was talking about these classical ideals and then how Blake and Runge specifically were kind of pushing against that. And so how the Gothic played with that um which does speak into literary tradition whether you did see that movement from the classical neoclassical into the gothic into the north um as well so that was very interesting um as a framework i think in terms of what they were presenting i was very excited to see um john flaxman's um sketches and prints and watercolors um with chatterton because thomas chatterton is a a key literary figure when you're thinking about gothic reception and kind of the burgeoning northern antiquarianism in Britain and so it was really interesting to see that and that was kind of on the central table line <laughs> a bit um so as you were kind of going around the exhibition and I think this was the case in all the rooms you ended up kind of doing multiple circuits because you had to see everything and in doing so you were able to kind of see new connections between the pieces as you were taking in more stuff um but at the same time i think in hindsight i made a lot of the connections myself because 
it is my area. So I was kind of, I was able to make the connections between Chatterton and the Gothic, the antiquity, and, you know, while learning new things about the art academies and how Blake was kind of involved in all of that. A bit further down in, I guess, the final room, the yellow room, um, they brought in the narrative of the romantic nationalism with um, James McPherson and the and Runga's Ossian Prince, which I was also very excited to see. Um, but to me, then, it kind of created this question of why wasn't this referred to earlier on? Because McPherson and Ossian, that's all so important in terms of crafting this question and this engagement with antiquity in Blake, because it is known that Blake um, looked up to Macpherson and the Austin poems. And so it kind of made me wonder, could this have been placed more as a transition? Um, could there have been more of a narrative? Could we have learned a little bit more about it? So then by the time we reach the romantic nationalism section, we would have a bit more of an understanding. But I don't know, those are, those are my kind of thoughts coming from the angle of this is my area, <laughs> my research area. Thanks. What what do you make in relation to that, Anise, and also your response to the the the, the early part of the exhibition? Um, yeah, I was also I, I think slightly confused, probably by having the the Ossian prince in the the third room, in the last room. Um, although I did sort of tr I think they were trying to make it like a circular kind of you, you because you went round the room so many times, it was almost as if the exhibition itself became circular and i think that was that was um what it was trying to do it was trying to make you think beyond what was just in that room and i mean they did that quite well with that they had like window parts to other rooms um where even when you were say in the blue room you could see into the yellow room and they would have something highlighted through that particular window so it nothing ever felt as if it that was the only way to read it um you should be aware of the different links um, I really enjoyed the um, the antiquity and the Gothic um, section, especially the way they'd put the, the like a glass table part in the middle with open things open like books and various objects rather than just having pictures. Um, I think what for me the one that stood out in that room, if you like, was probably Joseph of Arimathea on the rocks, which I have never seen in person before. And it it has a very gothic kind of feel the way the way it's presented the the way it's um, the way the lines are used, but it's very antiquarian at the same time. And it seems to be like the pin of, it, for me that's always the pinnacle piece of the gothic and antiquity Blake's Blake's work. But also I think it linked quite nicely to the whole idea of his universe because it's it's his idea of of myth building and, and creating Albion within like a, a world structure so i yeah for me that 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 bit stood out especially because it was on a wall that was facing away from the the entrance you went in and there was a wall in front of you and then this was on the back of the wall so it was almost like you had to look back on yourself so you had to you were actually literally like looking into the past of where you where you just walked um and i thought that that was that was done really well I think it's also really interesting because like it because of where it was placed, it was almost the start. And I think in the catalogue, it is actually the beginning of the section that talks about the Gothic and antiquity. And I, I will say I really did like in that room because I, I think like Anissa and I, we spent a lot of time in that room just going round and round and like the way that they placed Blake's work in between everyone else. So you could see visually the connections and OK, so they're all kind of taking the similar or the same topics. How have they all addressed it? And you can then, especially with that, um, the Joseph of Arimathea, you see the development, which I thought was really cool as well, yeah. And of course, um, Joseph of Arimathea amongst the rocks of Albion is the first original engraving that Blake does. It's, so it is the marking of his beginning as a, a, an, an artist, as a en professional engraver. It's probably worth just mentioning, you, you say on the back of that wall as you enter, that, that prior to arriving at this first room, there's a small antechamber with a number of um, portraits 
and primarily self-portraits of other artists that are kind of, I suppose that gives the context of this theme of placing Blake amongst his contemporaries. I just want to pick up a couple of points that you, you'd both mentioned. I mean, um, Sharon, you'd mentioned a kind of a, that you were filling in lots of gaps for the Gothic um, reception of Blake or Blake's reception understanding of the Gothic. It struck me, reading that room as a whole, I think you could have got away with not mentioning the Gothic, actually. That room for me was really a room about Blake as a neoclassical artist operating in a... a in what was a predominant art form of the late 18th century. You know, Blake as an early artist is very much, you know, this has been emphasised by the late Morris Eves and many others. You know, Blake started off as a neoclassical trained artist operating very much in these conventions. Uh, and for me, it, Blake's work as a whole, much of his, his development of a Gothic style comes later in his career. I'm thinking particularly the late illuminated books. Um, and the work he does, for example, on um, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, etc. Blake, from the 1800 onwards, becomes much more fascinated by the Gothic and much more overtly, exceptionally involved in depicting it artistically. His earlier work, by contrast, seems to be very neoclassical. I mean, there was a great focus on Flaxman, actually, if I remember, yes. in that room, which I really did like and I really appreciated that because he was such a big influence and you know that connection there and but I think the I think possibly the gothic it was kind of defined within the exhibition as a way that as scholars who possibly work on the gothic we don't actually read it as such so it might have meant more Germanic perhaps yeah. um rather than the gothic which means a quite a different Thing, actually and I think that's why possibly you and I and Anise we were all kind of filling in the gaps because we were approaching it as okay so the gothic we know what that is we know how that kind of was shaped or participated in Blake's literary works and you know in general but actually what we were seeing were the European the Germanic influences that kind of or the spread out into Europe in that way so it might have been the terminology that we were getting caught up on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which actually, that, I mean, taking us through um, that 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 early period into Europe in flames, the the the, the present. I mean, the, the past, the present, and the future is another way, of course, that this exhibition is framed. Um, so the red room with um, America and Europe. And Nisi, if I can bring you in in terms of a response to particularly the, the the you've already mentioned, you know, death on a pale horse, but also then those il illuminated books of Blake's that we see in that room. The way they were presented was really well done um they sort of felt like you said like a concertina um especially um the two in the middle which were america that was that was particularly amazing but when you walked in it was europe and it was that fantastic frontispiece from europe and it's not just it wasn't just great it's that's a really good copy. They have a really good copy of Europe and it's bright and vivid. And so the first image you see is the um, the angel in chains with their head hung low. So you, you already feel the, 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 the theme of this room is going to be dark. It's going to be, you're presented a kind of despair. This room is not going to be a happy room it's not going to be a room of redemption this is going to be a room of fire war and death and that is exactly what you get and as you go round the many times you have to go round to understand what's going on because it is impossible to just it, because there's a part in the middle you have to choose which bit you do first and then you sort of go round again and then I went backwards as well to see if it if it worked that way um so you sort of become entrapped in this this ongoing idea of like revolution war um and almost unable to escape and and when you do get to the to the the door to the next room if you like it sort of it doesn't feel like a door it feels more like an escape um and it's presented with like some of his really famous pieces just before you go through that door so you have um I believe Albion Rose was there 
maybe I was mm-hmm. wrong. But mm-hmm. Albion Rose was there. So you, you sort of like go just before the door, you you leave that section from. You have that amazing um, redemptive piece that Blake works on, that kind of very famous. So you enter the room in chains. So you enter the room sort of down, down, bound, and you, you leave the room with the image of the, the, the outstretched arms and, and the feeling of, of freedom. So the, the, the whole room is kind of based around, those, I think, for me, it was based around working out where you were within those two images. Yeah. I love that reading, actually. that That's just a great, in terms of that transition from slavery to freedom, which, of course, is the whole point of Albion mm. Rose or Glad Day. Sharon, your responses. Yeah, I mean, like, building off that, I mean, just before you hit the Albion Rose, if I remember, you get on, like, the left-hand side, um, the House of Death print possibly like you have like so I think like yeah Anise like what you're kind of saying about how the exhibition itself kind of makes you think about that whether you realize it or not because of how you're going around it is really really smart and yeah I loved that room in terms of it kind of I don't know it felt like it, it was nodding towards I mean if you're a scholar it was like nodding towards all the things that you no, <laughs> like you kind of understand or you you know it's kind of how you've approached it you're thinking oh yeah revolution all of this rebellion and these are kind of the basic um foundational um texts <laughs> like you know illuminated books when you're kind of thinking about um this period with Blake and yet it was also adding nuances and new things because of the setup and also with all the extra prints and other images that were around so I'm thinking about Gone at Terry's, um, Daniel's great image, which is one of my absolute favorite things ever. And I spent a very long time in that corner and it was right next, it was right next to Blake's death on a pale horse. So it was really interesting how that kind of was like measuring up because he had on the one hand, this amazing watercolor kind of drawing by Blake. And then you had a very starkly different interpretation of what was happening at the time in Europe and you know in terms of revolution and kind of pushing back against systems with the print itself um, which I don't think many people will know or have seen and it was it's like this incredible kind of fold out almost like a poster it makes me think of those kind of posters I used to collect as a teenager (laughs) just you know you fold it out of a magazine and stick it on your wall it kind of has that it's got this great essay as well um but it's basically of this body with all these words kind of inscribed or tattooed onto it, however you want to kind of um, interpret it with stuff like tyranny, corruption, and it's thinking about the government in such a bodily term. And that's also, I guess, partly my research area, but it was interesting to then see how Blake's interpretation with America and Europe in very in great bodily terms with you know, with the chains with the kind of the head bowed and then albion rose spreading out how that kind of played with contemporary interpretations as well albion rose glad day as the movement into this spiritual reawakening it actually then i was going to say a room but it's really a corridor between the two rooms and one of my favorite parts of the exhibition what i wasn't expecting is the collection of yakka burma works Mm -hmm. and those books with all their fold outs and their diagrams and their pop-ups and you know just what an incredible mechanism Burma's books were um and how Blake you know this is the point this was one of the the moments in the exhibition where I thought yeah this this is clearly the point where Blake is fully plugged into his contemporaries because he is very much attempting to do with the art of the book some of that kind of cabalistic and mystical um I don't like using the word occult with Blake, but you know that 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 way of dealing with these incredibly detailed visionary perceptions of the universe through these books. So I, I wonder if we'll go on to now to sort of um talk a little bit about Blake and his his relation to the European contemporaries, which is really built on this room, obviously with Otto Runger, with Caspar David Friedrich, but also for me, which I wasn't expecting, with Jakob Burma. Um, Anise, if I could bring you in this first. Um, yeah, that was a fantastic corridor room um it's, i understood what I, i'm gonna look at it first from how they presented it um because it was a dark room and, and in some ways that really worked but it actually also felt like 
almost as if you needed to get through it quickly to get to the next part, that, that it should have had um, more. It should have been more open. It was very um, con uh, confined. So people would sort of bottleneck it. So you, you actually couldn't spend as much time there as you wanted because otherwise you'd block everybody from getting to the other parts. Um, but there was so much there. So I think if it had been slightly wider, it, it would have been easier um, because you wanted to spend the time there, especially with those, those fold-out books, which were absolutely fantastic. Um, yes, it sh the, the Burma Room... Sh it shocked me because I sort of wasn't expecting it, especially where it was. Um, and it really showed, I think, the art... Uh, this, I, I don't know how to put this into words very well. It showed the darkness of Blake's art, the kind of harshness, the kind of... Not, not the themes and the ideas, the literal kind of hard lines. You felt this... In that room, you were like, yes, if if they had had the Book of Eurizen, it would have been in that room. It was that kind of hard, thick, dark lines, very solid. There was no room for movement. It was a kind of static, hard, concrete place. Um, and I think that there is a lot of that in Blake. And it was definitely there in, in the Burma. Yeah, I definitely agree with Anise. Like, I think, like with everyone, like you, Jason and Anise, I just wasn't expecting <laughs> any of Burma. But when I saw it, it, I was like, yeah, this makes sense. Like, of course, Burma as a connection. <laughs> like, I don't know why I didn't think of it before. Um, but then, yeah, that then did lead into further questions about why wasn't this kind of expanded more or kind of given room to breathe I think because the books themselves were so detailed so detailed and I think there was so much that was left unsaid I think about it and especially if you don't work on Burma like I don't work on Burma and I don't work on Burma's connections to Blake so I know that there are connections I just don't know them in detail it kind of that cramped spaceness and kind of thoroughfare um it made me feel a little bit like, am I missing something? Um, what What is the actual kind of connection? Because it came just after the paradise we gained, if I remember um, that section before moving into that final room. Um, I think it worked as a, as a connection, as a connector, um, because it did kind of have that shift in feeling as well as that shift in material and subject matter as well but it also did kind of flag up that materiality of the book I was obsessed with that pop-up um with all the little <laughs> flaps and kind of and like the, just was this body I'm not even sure what it was really showing but it was the body of a man right who was kind of apparently you could lift it up and it would reveal other bits and it was all I the thought, bits of the universe kind of contained in his organs etc yeah that Absolutely was just astonishing so cool and I think they could have either expanded it more or just kind of placed it in a way that centralized all the attention and focus onto that as a now we are definitely transitioning into the next bit this is why this is a a stepping stone um, and then we we pass through there that stepping stone from yaka mm -hmm. straight i mean the, the the next big part of the exhibition is really then these european contemporaries runga uh, to a lesser degree casper david friedrich but I was thinking in particular, you know, what you come into then this this series of unfinished drawings and engravings and paintings mm -hmm. by Runga uh, Times of Day, which was this massive project that he was intending to complete, you know, never, was never finished during his lifetime. But it's, you know, this incredibly complex and um, almost allegorical uh, exploration of the state of the, the human soul. And on that level, uh, at this point, I think, OK, I was I was actually very impressed because I've never seen these um, most of these illustrations, just one or two. I've been less impressed the further I've been from the exhibition, actually, in the sense that when I first saw them, it's kind of the sense of okay, I can I see immediately now why Fitzwilliam would want to compare these two artists side by side. And then there's there's, there's various bits in the catalogue where they say you know um, Runga and Blake have often been 
held uh, as contemporaries because they were romanticists. So I was just wondering if either you had any comments on those connections and that presentation of Runga and Blake. Sharon, I can see you're nodding your head. So yes, yeah. I mean, I think I, I think I definitely agree. And in this room, I'm trying to remember where everything was kind of placed. And the main thing was um, the times of day, the, the Runga that kind of took up quite a lot of it. Um, and the way that they kind of structured and I guess the thematic overview of this room was kind of a progression of the gothic and antiquity room it's kind of thinking about Blake's new style and the 1800s and kind of how does that place within um his European contemporaries how does that kind of speak to the others and it was kind of described as the growing influence of the medieval gothic art and I think because of that, I was, again, expecting possibly a little bit more of kind of the gothic elements and the medieval. And I am wondering if, again, it actually it is just the language choice, the word choice that was used, because perhaps it is more the Germanic influences rather than the gothic medieval. Um, because in terms of the spiritual renewal in that respect, I am kind of thinking more about the Macpherson and the Ossian yes. prince again. It does it does make sense because it's thinking about nationalism, this kind of championing of a new age and a new dawn. However, if the medieval and the Gothic is kind of the end point again, then I would have expected a bit more of that in the Europe room, actually, um, to kind of make that make a little bit more sense in that final room. And actually the i'm just kind of quickly looking at the catalog as well the way that they're kind of describing the mcpherson romantic nationalism elements because it, i mean it was huge in europe the the reception of the ocean poems was absolutely massive everywhere and it was so influential but it's described as the nordic songs of ocean in the catalog which it isn't <laughs> and um <laughs> just to kind of put it out there and so it does feel like the room the setup and kind of the framework was trying to really push home the gothic connections which I don't think quite worked especially because if I remember the times of day um the figure um of dawn or it was very very classical it just kind of spoke more about the classical the neoclassical rather than the gothic still so i was struggling to make it that connection but i think the fact that they were unfinished works was really interesting yes. because it it kind of also made it feel as though it was open for the future it was open for us to kind of complete the image to you know take it on further and i i quite like that aspect Anise, how about you? Um, yeah, just building on um, Sharon's um, comment on the unfinished thing, um, I, I I was really um, impressed that they'd included the Book of Job um, in, in that room. And I was trying to understand for a long time why that was there, other than the, the, the religious connections, I, I got that. And then I realised that other than the, the, the paintings right before the exit door, everything in that room is uncoloured. Everything in that room has no colour in it. It's all just in black and white or grey and white pencil. So it is literally unfinished in terms of colour. The copy of Jerusalem they have is sort of the black and white copy. It's not a very coloured, it's not one of the bright coloured copies. It's a very, dull is not the word, but it's a very uncoloured copy. And so in the first part of that room, if you go from the left side, there is no colour. Um, so everything is is sort of lines and everything is the room itself is is bright, but the 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 art itself is completely uncolored. And as you, you it's only till you go to the the end of the room or the end of the exhibition that the, the colors put in again. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting. So they'd worked on the idea of unfinished pieces, but also the pieces that were finished weren't colored. So it was almost like they were waiting to be finished. Um, the the runga the the the, the times of the day um, just for me I sort I sort of understood where they were going for with it because I think they were moving towards how art was going to move and with Blake's Job especially 
it's very kind of pre um art nouveau you can see all the lines coming in you can see all the kind of how the later um artists pulled from their artistic styles but i think like jason said that they those two are runga and blake are doing very different things they're just using a style that later people would have seen as similar and there's also then other p artists that we've only, we've not touched on one at all um which is samuel palmer and of course there's a couple of exquisite um paintings by palmer which really i, I mean, for me palmer's also one of the most interesting of the 19th century artists who from blake almost takes a point of liberation you can literally engage in an entirely new art form which consequently becomes incredibly influential on later illustrators and designers and, you know it's a massive role to play in 20th century art but also then another artist who is one of the great giants of european romanticism which is casper david friedrich they offer not so much a point of a parallel with blake I think what you see, because they're, they're very close to the Samuel Palmer um, paintings, they show actually two directions, two divergent directions that European art were going to take in the 19th century. Friedrich, by essentially taking a realistic approach to, the, you know, that come out of post-Renaissance um, and Enlightenment art, but actually to imbue it with spiritual meaning. So, you know, sort of the famous... Uh, wanderer standing looking out to the sea etc and all these 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 realistic portrayals of churches and forests etc that do not exist they're actually entirely products of the imagination but done in this naturalistic style in contrast then to palmer who takes from blake this much more um th this much more graphic style this this style that actually does not look to the external world at all for its inspiration, but entirely co concentrates on the interior. And that, for me, in the end, that, I think that was a big difference between, stylistically, the European artists that they're including, Runga and Friedrich, were actually drawing upon, essentially, uh, naturalistic depictions. And actually, what you see through Blake and then through Palmer, and the Book of Job is a brilliant example of this, you see these non-naturalistic, non-representational approaches to spiritual art, which, ironically, and this why it still remains one of the great the great unexpected deliveries of this exhibition is in the Burma. The Yakub Burma is entirely dealing with these abstractions of a mental and moral and cosmological universe, which Blake completely responded to. You know, that's the point where Blake plugs fully into a European tradition for me. So any final thoughts on William Blake's universe? Um, there was just one thing about the final room that I found very interesting. Um, the Palmer and the Blake were very small. They went for the really small pictures. The like the Book of Job is really quite small. Um, next to the Runga, and I mean, I I know the Friedrich was small, but that compared to his other work, but compared to Blake's, the Runga and the Friedrich was dwarfing everything else. It mm. was huge. Mm but it seemed to lack the kind of depth that came in these really small pictures with Blake and Palmer that seemed to draw you in. They had this kind of weird, strange depth, this kind of detail that the larger pictures just didn't have. They, they sort of, they were very flat. And I know they were unfinished, but there was something missing. There was kind of, they're so big, they overwhelmed you with their immensity because they were large. But the immensity was found in the in the small, uh, rather than in the large. And it kind of felt like blueprints. And I think by the time I kind of reached the end of the exhibition, it was interesting to kind of reflect and then think about the connections that I learned about the you know the the stuff with the Copenhagen um, Royal Academy of Arts and that kind of thing. And you know thinking about all these connections in a new light through the artistic. Um, viewpoint rather than the literary um but it was interesting then to kind of think further about Blake's work and how we do kind of see them as like this blueprint for revolution and you know all of that during the period you know we think about America and Europe in sometimes quite static terms because we don't actually place them within the context of the art as well as the literary and I think 
it's so important in Blake studies to be coming at it from both angles. Even if we are, you know, literature scholars or art scholars, we need to always be aware of those different connections. So I think that was kind of... And there has, over the past two decades, mm. there's been a strong resurgence of interest in, yeah. like, in terms of artistic studies. You know, he, he is no longer a second-rate artist, which I think in the 20th century, too many literary scholars in particular placed him. Yeah. Um, for me, I mean, the final comment is, is that it really was a pleasure to see what is one of the major holdings of Blake's art in Britain, so much of it on display um, at William Blake's universe. So this runs through for um, until May. And if you ha haven't had a chance to see it already, we highly recommend that you do go and visit. Um, and also, I mean, the, the Fitzwilliam itself is a wonderful building in a quite incredible city. So my thanks again to Anise Rogers and Sharon Cho for joining me. Um, be sure to join in next time where we'll be, we'll be discussing other aspects of Blake's life, work and reception. Thank you. Thank you.